Woods, W5. For heaven's sakes, people, do stay away. A small town stunned by a shocking robbery. Something bad's gonna happen. Nothing I've ever seen the likes of in my entire life. That leaves death, destruction, and questions in its wake. Who was this guy? In that moment, I thought, this isn't real. The next thing I remember, I'm running down the street, screaming. Here is Avery Haynes. Welcome to W5. It is one of Canada's most bizarre mysteries. An armed robber almost pulls off a heist in a small town bank until a dramatic incident that leaves a thousand spectators horrified. To this day, it's a tale with an unbelievable hole in the story, one that Adrian Gobriel investigates in this one hour special. We're just waiting now to see what develops. There's a dark and mysterious past in this picturesque community. My first thought is, oh shit, this is big. It was just creepy. It went from dead silence to craziness. People running, screaming. What just happened? This is Kenora, Ontario, a small city near the Manitoba border surrounded by lakes and forest and everyone here either remembers or has heard of the city's most infamous day. Cloudy with occasional light rain expected for the remainder of today. Just it was a May afternoon, cool and dreary, just before 3 p.m. A masked man walked into this Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce carrying a duffel bag and two guns. This film is from a 1983 W5 investigation that traced the man's path. He walked into the manager's office, interrupting a phone call, telling manager Al Reed that he wanted money and perhaps, oddly, that he should call police. Then he ordered the customers to get out. May 10th, 1973 is to Kenora as 9-11 is to New York. Joe Ralco was a high school senior on that fateful day. He was about to witness his life's most memorable moment. He says when the crowd filed out of the bank, people noticed, in particular, the people who worked across the street. The radio station was almost directly across the street. So by removing the windows, the two reporters had a clear line of sight to what was going on from the second floor offices. Ladies and gentlemen, a continuing report on the attempted bank robbery at the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce on Main Street. We've spoken to a number of people on the street who allegedly saw this take place. John, I think we'll stay here just for a few more moments. These radio reporters were hanging out of the windows of their station doing a play-by-play. -play. Literally hanging out uh, the second floor windows uh, above Main Street watching it. Speaking at the same time into microphones, this is old school, so it was cables that were run 25 to 50 feet back into the control room. The man is holed up in the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. Back then, it was pretty rare for any local radio station to cover breaking news live. But CJRL's two newsmen, Chris Paulson and John Barry, did just that. There are a number of people, Chris, coming down to the area. For heaven's sakes, people, do stay away. Let's not hamper the police department's operation. Please stay away from Main Street. It is not a sideshow. On the live radio broadcast, they're telling people, stay away from the bank. Yeah. That doesn't happen. What happens? The opposite happens. More people that listen to the broadcast decide they're going to go downtown. There's even stories of parents going to elementary schools demanding that their children be taken out so they can take them downtown to watch the robbery. Not just a few people, but an estimated 1,000, which was more than 10% of the entire community's population at the time. The radio said, don't go downtown. And I'm thinking, what? It's a sleepy town. There's nothing happening usually. Here's a piece of excitement, and I'm not going to go downtown? So you did the opposite? Oh, well, of course. Duh. Paula Eiler was 19 years old, and like many, dropped everything to take in the growing spectacle. 
I was coming from work. I was working at a summer job at Kentucky Fried Chicken. And it was a couple of blocks up that way. Just a couple blocks away. Yeah. I assumed he had a gun. I thought, I'll stand in the second row. If there's a stray bullet, they'll take the bullet. All I've got showing is my head. What are the chances of a stray bullet hitting a target this big? The situation inside, no one really knows for sure. The robber invited police inside the bank to prove to them that he had dynamite. He also shared something even more menacing. In his mouth, he held what looked like a wired up clothespin. He told the manager that it was a dead man switch, which would trigger the bomb if he became incapacitated. A dead man switch, the name comes from, if you release it, you're a dead man. We didn't do it a lot, but every once in a while, we'd just take an afternoon off and go and play pool. Two doors down, Chris Tittlemeyer was skipping school at a pool hall. He was 17 and had no idea what was happening outside. A cop came into the pool hall and said, there's a bank robbery in progress. you got to get out. And we just laughed, and we knew the guy. And he said, yeah, right, like this is Kenora. Yeah. Not Chicago or something, you know. <laughs> So we continued playing pool, and the guy came in and said, hey, you know what, there's a bunch of people in police cars, and I think the bank is actually seriously being robbed. Uh, we went outside, and there were police cars, people milling around. What's going through your mind in that moment? In that moment, I thought, this isn't real. What do you see? You're probably wondering, what's all this traffic? Well, the closer we got, we could see there were police vehicles. Selfishly, I was hoping something would happen. What we should do is just hold tough here for a few moments to see if this can be negotiated peacefully and everything will turn out all right. Kenora, was it a place where big, exciting things happened? There was no big, exciting things happened. The radio reception was so bad that even though we were 200 kilometers east of Winnipeg, you could rarely get radio signals from there for AM radio. But on this day, there is a policeman up on our roof, CJRL's roof right now, with a rifle. The local AM radio station was loud, clear, and riveting. A crowd gathered there, but now they have been cleared. Come on, everybody, way back. You can hear the police moving the people back from deed from both ends. Sometimes the police officer would turn and he would push our line backwards. So he would walk forward and we would follow him like this. You're creeping up behind them. Yep. Back inside the bank, the robber and his reluctant helpers continued filling the bags with money. And then something extraordinary happened that nobody expected, least of all, the armed robber. Only one time did he lose his temper, and that's when uh, a man staggered into the bank from the hotel next door. Hold on. In the middle of the bank robbery, a guy who's had too many drinks walks in. Yeah. The Dalmore Hotel was also a local drinking hole, and one of the customers announced that he was going to be a hero. He told his friends he was going to end the robbery, staggers in, because there was no police stopping him at that point, and has this confrontation. The bank manager told him to leave. He didn't, which he soon regretted. The robber pulls out his handgun and fires into the floor, and the man ran out. 40 years ago, W5 spoke to the man's nephew, who'd heard the story of the bullets that almost hit his inebriated uncle. One, I think, went in between his legs and one on the other side. What did your uncle think of that? <laughs> he was gone. We haven't, we never seen him for about a week later. He was lucky he wasn't shot by the robber. Two shots fired and there were more to come. The next one was less planned. The robber takes his rifle and decides he's going to try and pry open one of the teller drawers to get more money, puts the barrel of the rifle in, and guess what? The rifle goes off. Scares the hell out of him. One of the bank employees was blissfully unaware of the robbery. She was one floor down on a coffee break. She's downstairs and hears it and jokingly says to herself, oh, I guess the bank's being robbed. And she sits there and keeps finishing her coffee as though nothing goes on. 
Next door was Woolworth's department store. That's where an 18-year-old Barb Manson was working. A police officer came in and he told us either to move to the back of the store or vacate the store. And I guess my expectation was they would clear the block. That didn't happen? That didn't happen, no. In fact, the crowd continued to grow. Most were oblivious to the fact that the robber had guns, a load of dynamite, and a dead man's switch in his mouth. We are not uh, trying to speculate as to what is going on inside. Inside, the robber told police he wanted a getaway truck and a driver. A cop volunteered to get dressed in plain clothes. Officer Don Milliard likely had no idea the immensity of what was about to happen. What does the Kenora bank robber ask him? He asked him to pick up the money and take it out and put it in the truck. And I'm thinking, something bad's going to happen. The bank robber walks out the doors. What happens the moment the doors open? A thousand people standing around, and you could have heard a pin drop. OK, now they're coming back out again. And then it's absolute chaos. What? Bomb the bomb has gone off. Kaboom. Kaboom. The bomb has gone off. He's been shot. He's been it's shot. gone in front of the... Everything is just rancid. Stay back. Our hearts went kaboom. And then the front of the store, it was like an updraft, and the windows went up and came crashing down. And then the blood, then the money, and the body parts. Ladies and gentlemen, the bomb has gone off, ladies and gentlemen. Windows have been blown out, literally, all over the place. There's debris, there are pieces of clothing. A Kenora police officer, Sergeant Bob Latane, had shot the robber, who less than a second later disintegrated in a violent explosion. The entire front of the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce has just exploded. It smelled like chaos. It smelled like we were in a war zone. It smelled like dead body parts. It smelled like old money. Those smells just inundate you. Next thing I remember, I'm running down the street, screaming. When we come back, the bank robber is lying at the side of the truck. Searching for the identity of a mysterious stranger. Who is this man who attempted to rob the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce? When W5 continues, Now they're coming back out again. The clothes peg in his mouth. He is carrying a flight bag. Uh, with... what? Bloody hell, the bomb's the gone bomb off. has gone off. The bomb, a bomb has off. gone off. He's been shot. May 1973, and a bank robber wired to a bomb just exploded in front of a Kenora bank and about a thousand spectators, all caught live on radio. The entire front of the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce has just exploded. Things are falling from the sky. Windows have been blown out literally all over the place. There's debris, there are pieces of clothing. And as I look up, I could see something coming through the air. Jeff Strachan was a grade eight student standing just down the street at the public library. Something's flying through the air. Arcing through the air. And I'm thinking it's a piece of a car. And I watch and it hits about here and it didn't bounce, it splatted. And my brain told me then, that's a piece of a person. My friend actually had a piece of the bank robber land on his forehead. Friend had a piece? Yeah, just something went splat. And he went, oh, that was gross. What was that like? Well, it was kind of freaky. He thinks it was a piece of large intestine, but we could never really identify it because he didn't. we didn't hang around. <laughs> The bank robber is lying at the side of the truck. One could only assume that whoever he is, is no more. Pieces of the robber covered the street for blocks. And maybe it was because she worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken, but Paula Eiler saw something else. I'm thinking, why is there chicken 
on the street. That doesn't make any sense at all. You thought you saw chicken on the yeah. ground. <laughs> yeah, pieces of chicken, but it wasn't. It, it, I think it was pieces of the bank robber. Every window for blocks was blown out. Dazed spectators tried to process what they just witnessed, including a woman who worked at the radio station. All right, you're all right, love, you're all right. One of our office girls is uh, in a state of shock. Can someone look after one of the girls here, please? Nothing I've ever seen the likes of in my entire life, Chris. How much money is on the street? I don't know, and I wouldn't really like to hazard a guess. Hundreds, thousands of dollars. Money's flying through the air. It's drifting down like leaves from a tree in autumn. People running out and grabbing free money, free money, stuffing it in their pockets. Joe Ralco was a witness. The former journalist also wrote a book about the bomber called The Devil's Gap. Human remains, blood, ligaments, tendons. It was a very grotesque scene. The policeman who is with the, uh, the man appears to be not too badly injured. He has stomach wounds. Despite what the radio announcer thought, police officer Don Milliard's stomach wound was not what it seemed. He's on his knees holding his stomach. He's holding flesh and blood that he thinks is himself, but it's actually part of the robber. And he only acknowledges that when one of the constables says, Don, that's not part of you. Officer Milliard was rushed to hospital. He would survive, but with permanent hearing damage. Who is this man who attempted to rob the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce? That's a question which will uh, be answered, I've no doubt, shortly. And at first, it looked like the bomber would be identified quickly. A local hotel manager called police. He recognized the robber as one of his guests. He registered at the Kenrisha Hotel, which at that time was the oldest and swankest hotel in town, under the name of Paul Higgins, and gave his address as 435 Glen Drive in Toronto. A name and an address. It sounded like a pretty good lead. The hotel manager told police that Paul Higgins checked in stayed for a couple days, and then disappeared for 10 days. He ordered staff to keep out while he was gone. I did speak with some of the staff, and they said that to get $34.75 a night for an empty room, that was big money. So it was OK with them, because he prepaid to hold the room, and they just said, fine. The hotel room could have clues. This W-5 investigation from 1983 describes what police found. He left behind a trunk in room 407. Police thought it might be rigged as a bomb, so a bomb disposal squad blew it up, and with it, any clues it might have contained as to who he was. Meanwhile, police ran a check on the man's name and address and didn't get the information they hoped for. It was a fake name. It was a fake address. This is the coroner's statement after he examined the body, which had been largely blown apart. Hands were still intact, which meant fingerprints were possible. The coroner recommended an inquest to review how police handled the matter and to identify the mystery man. Police circulated a composite sketch, and it turned out that plenty of people saw the red-headed man with a German accent and a pink jacket, including Joe Ralco. He was wandering around town every morning with purpose. He got into habits of going primarily to the Plaza restaurant, where I saw him and others saw him on a regular basis, and it was really creepy. Creepy because of where and how he sat. He always sat here. Tina Adamopoulos was just two when the stranger came to the restaurant she now runs, but her parents told her the story of the peculiar patron. Your mother is serving him. Yes. What strikes her as odd? He would always sit facing the restaurant, which she found odd because most people would want to face out, primarily because the windows were a lot bigger than they are now, so you could actually see people like walking back and forth. So most so people would sit at this table, table and they would be looking out the big windows yeah, and enjoying Yeah, for themselves. sure. So it forced people to look at him. And if you're going in for coffee or lunch and you, you see this man, in a pink plaid jacket and a fedora staring back at you. It was just creepy. Tina was too young to remember. OK, what about Quantro? But she was in the restaurant the day the robber exploded. One of his last meals was here. He came every day at the same time. It was ham, scrambled eggs, 
toast and black coffee. And that's all he ever ate. By the day two or three, she was like, you know, she would just say the usual, and he'd be like, yep. I don't know, I just think it's completely crazy. I didn't know that this restaurant had such a big part in his daily life as he was planning what he was gonna do. Within a month, June 1973, a coroner's inquest began at the Kenora Courthouse. The police officer who was injured in the blast, Don Milliard, testified that police had no plan and were left to act on their own. It was a bunch of police officers trying to figure out what to do with no clear command and control. Who's going to give instructions? Who's going to do what? Is there a hostage negotiator? No hostage negotiator. Is there one top cop in charge? No, there wasn't. The police denied any wrongdoing at the time and refused to offer W-5 an explanation. There's a public right to know about these Fine, things. Fine, you do your story. But uh, does that mean Mayor that Ken Winkler is a member of the police commission, which ordered the force not to talk to us, and he wouldn't talk on the record either. And the police chief changed his phone to an unlisted number when we pursued our inquiries. The coroner's jury concluded that all the police should be commended for their handling of the situation, and also decided Sergeant Bob Latane was justified in pulling the trigger, and possibly saved lives by doing so. He wanted to die. But author and witness Joe Ralco believes the bomber was not planning a mass murder. He stepped off the sidewalk. He squared himself up to the police lines to make himself a visible target. The sergeant took the shot. Bloody hell, the bomb's The bomb off. has gone off. So if he was a true terrorist, he could have run into the group and killed hundreds, but he didn't. He only killed himself. One thing the coroner's jury could not uncover inspired its last recommendation. The jury recommends that the investigation continue to prove the identity of the bank robber. Would you like to know who the Kenora bomber was? Who wouldn't like to know who the Kenora bomber was? I mean, we would all like to know. I would. I'd, I'd like it, a little bit of closure. Right now, it's some ghost came into town and blew himself up. Coming up. Well, why aren't they testing the DNA? Will the final resting place provide the final clue? Question is, how do you disinter a body? When W5 continues. This was a massive mistake. Fighting to save their home. They feel that that house is theirs. We have the deed. With their life savings at stake. Does this place feel cursed? W5 exposes a legal loophole. I'm never going to be all right with this. Leaving families stunned. We're not going to come to a settlement. And drowning in debt. We regret it. An all-new W5 with Avery Haynes, next Friday at 10 on CTV.